Puerto Rico for him to work. So, so my name is Kelly Andrews. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist for my, my company called Syncano. We're back end as a service. we help sponsor the event, but they tell me that's not why I got picked. Um, apparently, I submitted a good talk, so uh, they picked me for that. Uh, it's a bad joke. You guys can laugh at my bad jokes, too. Um, if you want to talk to me about that, I'm not talking about any of that right now. If you want to talk to me about that, see us at the sponsor table later. Um, today, we're going to talk about utilizing ES6 in React. Now, the reason why I put this talk together is uh, back in maybe March, I started playing around with ES6 and React, and it was sort of hard to figure out what was going on and what was changing, and uh, there's not a ton of resources out there to really understand what to do, um, and it's still pretty new for everybody, so I wanted to put more or less a primer together that says, here's what it used to look like, here's what it's going to look like, and give you sort of a reference on what things do and how they work now. Um, so that's, that's why I'm here. So, Obviously, this is the React.js room, uh, so I think most everybody's going to know what this is. Um, pretty sure. But just in case you don't, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you anyways. Uh, so React is obviously the open source uh, JavaScript library for creating user interfaces. Um, pretty popular. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy using it. Uh, it was the first framework that I felt like once I dug into it, I actually understood it. Um, it made the most sense to me. It was pretty fast. I tried Angular, I tried Ember, I tried all kinds of them, and this one I just finally settled on and uh, really enjoy. Uh, but it will help you, you know, build large applications and that kind of thing. And you know, you guys probably know what it is, so I'm not going to go on forever on that one. Uh, but what is uh, ES6? So if you don't know by now. Um, you probably should, but obviously it adds significant syntax for writing complex applications now. Uh, JavaScript's grown up, right? It's been, it's 20 now, it's going to drink next year, that kind of thing. Um, it, for me, ES6 really has solidified that JavaScript is coming of age and is being a real development uh, language now. Uh, it's no longer just something to interact with Java, uh, you know, in the front end, it's not just a toy to manipulate images and text, it's actually becoming uh, something real. And um, yeah, so it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, I'm excited about it. So does this even matter? Uh, it, you know, seriously it matters? Um, you know, so like I said, I started using it back in March, and now the code that I wrote then still works now. It's going to work forever uh, until ES7 comes out, but it gives me the ability to future-proof my code, uh, start using what's in there today, and um, I don't have to worry necessarily about breaking changes later because things have, have shifted and I, I didn't uh, plan ahead. So I've, I've been questioning, like, why are you using ES6 in this? And it's like because ES6 is real and it's awesome and you should everybody should use it. So, so I've kind of broken this down into three basic parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about setting up the workflow and what it actually takes to use React and ES6 together. Um, for anybody who has their computer and the internet actually works, uh, you can follow my GitHub repo. Uh, I have that in three branches. I have an ES5 branch, an ES6 branch, and an ES7 branch, because uh, I do a little bit of that as well, and I'll get to that at the end. Um, it was basically meant to be an example. It's not a great thing. It's just the timer example. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward, not too complex, but it gives you the ability to see what the syntax looks like uh, and the changes between ES5 and ES6 and what those look like. And it makes it uh, simple to sort of use as a reference. So let's talk first about the modules that I needed uh, to actually build this and make it work. Uh, so I set up NPM, I got my dev dependencies, and I first started out with, uh, well, one of the ones I needed was Babelify. Uh, so Babel, if you haven't heard yet, it's a transpiler for ES6. It also comes built in uh, with built-in support for JSX, so it makes it really easy to have one dependency and do two jobs at the same time. Um, that way, you know, code transformation happens really easy. So Babelify, uh, is the Browserify version of it, and it lets me use Browserify and Babel together uh, really easily. Uh, 
so Browserify, if you don't know what Browserify is, or maybe you use Webpack, uh, it's very similar. Uh, but, but it lets you use require syntax like you would on server-side node. And it lets me uh, bundle all my dependencies up into one, or in, the, in this case, I actually end up using two. Uh, I do that for, um, typically I do a vendor file, like when I'm developing, I'll have a vendor file uh, that I, I package because it's non-changing, and every time I save, I don't want to repackage all of my vendors uh, <coughs> and third-party stuff together. Um, in this case, it's actually only React, so it's it seems like overkill, but um, it's very really easy at that point to scale it out and add whatever vendors you want to uh, later. Um, yeah, so of course we need React, because otherwise you're not going to be able to do React without React, so it's sort of important. Uh, and then I use Watchify. So Watchify is also another package for Browserify, but it, what it, I mean, just like any other watch function, it lets me set watch, and then my app changes, uh, when my app files change, it will rebuild those automatically and, and repackage them. Um, typically I use something like Gulp. Uh, to do a task uh, for Browserify, so I don't actually need Watchify. Uh, but I'm actually using just NPM script here just to keep it simple and reduce the dependencies in my code example. Um, but yeah, typically I'll use like Gulp Watch and it'll re redo my Browserify actions for me <clears throat> and I don't have to uh, have another dependency. All right, so let's, call, uh, let's talk about the code transformations. Okay, so this is all in my NPM script, uh, and I basically just I'm walking you through the entire repo that I have out there for you. Um, so I created my build vendors, uh, and essentially it is going to run Browserify. Uh, it's going to require React, and it's going to spit out a vendors.js file. So if I wanted to do more, uh, like if I wanted to add... Uh, Lodash or something like that. I could easily just add those here, uh, and then I would have one package with my vendors, and those are accessible outside in my other Browserify packages as well. So uh, it makes it really convenient and makes your build times a lot quicker. And then I have my uh, build app uh, script, and that's going to do my Watchify, and it's actually going to look at my app.js file. Uh, so you point that to the top level file, and that kind of spiders out, gets all the requirements, and builds everything into one file for you. And this is where I'm actually doing my transformation on Babelify, uh, using Babelify. So my Babel transformation happens here, and I exclude React. So any of the other vendors that you have, you want to exclude those as well. And then I output that into script.js, and then I create one NPM script that basically is going to run my vendors and my app builds uh, at the first time, and then it just watches my app files from there. All right. So let's look at the initial setup of the files. So this is all pretty basic level stuff, so uh, hopefully not too boring. But so we have my uh, my HTML file. So when you set up uh, React for the first time, you want to have uh, pretty it's pretty basic stuff. I got some styling in the in the repo as well that you you'll see. Um, and no, no, that's really important for this, but uh, the main part is I just have my two scripts. I have my vendors first, and then my scripts second, so my app code follows the React file. And from there, so we've already covered the first part, uh, went through that quick enough, so hopefully it wasn't too bad. Went over the required modules. Uh, so you're going to need to do ES6, and uh, in pretty much any project, you're going to need Babel. Um, and, I mean, in this case, it's just convenient that it does the JSX transformations as well. Uh, we covered the code transformation and uh, what that actually looks like in the NPM scripts, and talked about the HTML setup and what that looks like uh, for us to be able to create. All right, so let's talk about some of the simplified syntax and the changes between ES5 to ES6. Okay, so here's what React looks like uh, in ES5. Uh, you simply, you have to run a create class method to be able to create uh, React components. 
Uh, you pass in basically the object. It's got all your methods. Uh, it's got the render function. Uh, and this is the base level React, uh, or, I'm sorry, the app function, the top level app. Uh, so at the very bottom, I just render out the app uh, and I post it to the document body. Uh, it's calling the component timer. And notice I'm using just require statements because Babelify makes that easy for me, or Browserify makes it easier. All right, so NES6, uh, the requires obviously change. So this is basic ES6 syntax uh, becomes imports. Okay, so this is, this is where things really start to get fun, right? The import's pretty basic stuff. Uh, the React app create class, however, you don't really need. Um, there's a workaround I'll tell you in a minute, uh, but I'm keeping things mostly pure ES6 here, so it's, uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little more in a minute, but uh, this becomes uh, an extend uh, of the React app component. So my app, instead of being a function, uh, becomes a, a new class, and it extends the React app component uh, class there. Uh, and then obviously with all ES6 uh, function declarations uh, get a little bit of a trim and they become really easy. So now my render function is called just like any other ES6 would be. So that's sort of the, the start, uh, but let's go into a little bit more and we'll go into the timer, uh, timer component and we'll see what that looks like. Okay. So we already know a couple of things can change here. Uh, we have the timer I have as a function. Um, I'm doing my require statements, and then uh, uh, those all change to that. So we already have that covered. We've got a couple of things already figured out. Nothing really new here. Um, but if you notice, I have a mix-in, right? So set interval is a mix-in. So after we change all this, uh, what happens to the mix-in? Well, Unfortunately, mix-ins and the way they're currently built, uh, it actually doesn't work. Um, so it's sort of a sort of an issue uh, with some of the some of the functionality out there for ES uh, for React. But I'll get to it a little bit more. But just know that mix-ins are generally unavailable in the ES6. Uh, essentially, create class method allowed that to happen. Um, the method, the functionality in that uh, let mixins work, but since the class declaration is now there, it actually goes away, and it, I'm not exactly happy about it. Um, okay, so like I was saying, there is a workaround. The workaround is basically you mix ES6 and ES5, and you run the function instead of extending the class. Um, so if you want to talk to me about that, you can catch me afterward, and I can explain a little bit more about how that works. But I'm trying to keep this pure ES6, so know that in ES6 it, it, it doesn't work. So it kind of sucks. Um, okay, so then exporting modules. Uh, obviously, if, if you've heard a little bit about how this changes in ES6, uh, it's not much different. So I'm going to do export default, and now my timer is uh, available for other um, other modules to consume it. Okay, props and state. Right, so these uh, these get a little bit of a change. We'll talk about that here. Uh, so in ES5, these are all brought in using methods. So you have the get default props function uh, and the get initial state method, and those bring back all the pieces that you need. Uh, but that doesn't actually work now in ES6. It's a little different. So get default props. It uh, actually has to become a property of the class, and you define that after uh, the actual class is uh, declared. So default props moves all the way to the bottom of my code, uh, and it becomes a, an additional property that I add. Uh, there's also prop types, and you can do those um, also at the end and add a new property. Uh, so if you want to do something like a prop type and have have some binding there, you can do that as well. Uh, my example of repo doesn't actually have that, but figured I'd show it anyways. All right, how about the constructor method? Um, since we're out, we have a class, we need a constructor. Uh, so ES6 uses constructor methods, and we didn't really have that in ES5. Uh, so this is actually where our initial state goes. 
Okay, so now we change to a constructor method, and we drop uh, this dot state. So when this uh, new class, when this new React component is called, that constructor method runs, and state is set there. Then if you're passing any properties to the component, you actually want to pass those into the constructor method and then run super on those. And then you have uh, properties available as well. All right, so seriously, there's no mix-ins. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm really upset about it. Uh, so this was a mix-in we had. Um, and unfortunately, now all this code goes into our Tyler component. Uh, we'll clean it up a little bit, and now we have an ES6 um, version of that mix-in built into our uh, class. Now, I mean, this is a really contrived example, right? So it gets more complex and more critical. Um, I mean, these aren't exactly lengthy functions, but if you have a lot of functionality in a mix-in, uh, this could get problematic. Uh, except. So there's another issue that we run into. Now that we have those in there, binding, um, there's actually a new function I'm going to introduce here, which is tick. Okay, so tick is a function. We're going to clean this up. Um, this dot set state and this dot props. Uh, so this on tick is actually, we don't, it doesn't know what it is. Uh, it's not been bound. So the, the concept of this is, you know, tick is unaware of that. Uh, so they used to be available in ES5, but now they're not. So we have to actually bind this directly. And we're going to do this in our constructor method. So this.tick equals this.tick that bind this. Uh, so when it is, when you're initially calling uh, this component, now you have availability in tick uh, method to have this. So every function that you build that needs access to this, uh, you're going to have to do uh, this kind of thing in ES6 to get it bound. Um, I tried the fat arrow a couple weeks when I built this out, like four weeks ago. That was not working for me. Um, there's a GitHub issue that I can't tell if it's been resolved yet, and I haven't gone back and tested, but maybe it is. Um, but it makes things a lot easier. It makes doing this binding. So if you don't know what the fat arrow does, it binds automatically, luxly binds this uh, to your method. So it makes this a lot simpler. Uh, but in my example, that I had this working, and I could not get uh, the fat arrow to, to actually bind it. So so I stuck with this, and I know this works. Uh, but happy to entertain pull requests on my not really. Uh, just let me know if you've tried it and it now works, because I haven't gone back to this. So. OK, then we have our render, uh, render function, which looks like this. And then I used uh, let scope to just keep those there and show that you can use those just like any other um, block scoping. Uh, so it works just as you'd expect uh, with any other ES6. All right, so let's take a look at sort of where we've come already. So here's a before, and it's really small, but uh, so ES5, all the different things that you normally are used to and what I've always been used to doing React is all there. Now it changes to the more um, ES6 style uh, with the imports and the export uh, constructor method. Uh, the default props being set afterward, uh, and the binding of this uh, for tick. All right. So yeah, so we covered default props, uh, where those go, default and the uh, prop types, they go after the class. Uh, prop state and bind, so the constructor method, um, passing in props to the super function, uh, that's setting the state all in the constructor method and sad face for mix-ins. All right, but, oh wait. So not only is this utilizing ES6, but I actually went ahead and checked out some of the newer stuff, and we're gonna do the S7 as well. Um, and I actually got to use Comic Sans in a presentation. I'm really happy about that. Um, thank you for laughing. <laughs> I 
actually thought it was uh, thought it was really successful. So, uh, so Babelify. Uh, there is in, in Babel you can use. It, there's different stages. Um, so in this one I use stage zero, which is straw man, which kind of gives me everything, and it's not something I put in production code because that stuff's going to change at any moment. You don't really know what it's going to change to. Uh, they're still defining it. Uh, there's stage one, which is in proposal. Uh, so it's a little more defined, uh, but still not really uh, drafted, which stage two, so if you set the, uh, the flag, stage flag there to two, uh, you'll get things in draft mode that are only in draft. Uh, stage three is a candidate, so everything that's in candidate for candidacy for ES7, uh, you'll, you'll be able to use that functionality now. And stage four is finished. So stage four is obviously the most stable. Uh, stage three is definitely, um, I wouldn't probably shy away from using stage three. Like I'd feel more or less comfortable once it gets a candidate stage, it's probably not gonna change a whole lot. But if you really wanna make sure that it's locked down stage four, you can actually use ES7 functionality today. So it's kinda cool. Okay, so here's where we were with ES6 as a quick refresher. Props in state. So before we had to do things a little different, but in ES7, it's going to start to change a little bit. So as opposed to uh, adding a new property to the timer class at the end, uh, we actually create a static, uh, static object, static property, and set that right inside uh, at the top of our class decoration. So that'll be kind of nice. Uh, it'll keep everything cleaned up and together <coughs> inside the component. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, this dot state in a constructor method uh, becomes its own, just becomes a property as well. Uh, so you don't have to declare it necessarily in the constructor method. So that cleans up the constructor a lot too. Uh, binding this. So if you remember before, we had to bind this in the constructor method as well. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I can use a fat arrow now uh, in ES7. So it worked for me in ES7, it did not work for me in ES6. Uh, so the branch, I, the branches that I have, ES6, uh, would, I could not get this to work. So if, I could have been doing something wrong, but uh, it definitely worked in the ES7 version. Uh, but this lets me remove that entire line uh, and basically bind this directly to tick with a fat arrow. And now set state and props are easily uh, accessed. So. I'm a big fan of that. Okay, so what about mix-ins? All right, so this is kind of, this is where I use the straw man because mix-ins in, um, for ES7 are under heavy debate on how they're gonna be used. Um, where it's at now feels decent. I'm not sure if that's gonna be where it ends up, but it's definitely better uh, than having to include a bunch of code in your component. Um, Okay, so the mix in was basically this code. And in ES7, we have what's called now class decorators. Uh, so the at symbol, which, I mean, other languages have this kind of thing, so it's, it, it's starting to make sense and they're starting to build this in, which is great. Um, but this worked for me. So I set up a class uh, decorator here and moved that. Uh, back into its own file for the ES7 version. Uh, so it's a little different. Let me talk, this, talk through this a little bit. So the set interval function um, takes the composed component. So everything after it gets passed in. And once it gets passed in, then I can export this uh, just like normal. Um, but essentially it wraps a functional wrapper around all of my code. And then you'll see um, so I use like a ref uh, object in uh, React, so I knew I knew what the timer tick was set at. Um, but then I return in my render, I return the composed component, and I reference it as the timer. So I think this is probably where it's going to end up. It seems to be where people are leaning towards. Um, it seems a little convoluted, but all you're doing literally is just wrapping the method name uh, for the mix-in around pretty much the same functionality. Uh, and then you just return the compose component. So the, 
the class decorator is going to pull everything in and then just put it all back out and add the functionality to it. Um, it's pretty much only going to be for things that contain um, the, uh, I'm drawing a blank, I'm sorry, uh, like component did mount, component will unmount, the um, timing, uh, I can't think of it. Anybody help me? What's uh, what it was called? The um, Life cycle, thank you. I'm like, it's on the tip of my tongue, you cannot think of it. Yeah, so all the life cycle functions, uh, that's where it's really critical um, that, that this won't work. Uh, you can pretty much add anything that doesn't have life cycle functions, but um, if you have a life cycle function, it needs to behave this way. So again, I wouldn't necessarily put this in like a project uh, and use it um, in, in finalized code, but it's kind of cool to look at, and the fact that I can do all this and test it out, and then maybe eventually when this becomes real uh, and becomes finished, then we can start using it. Um, and I do like the idea of Babel uh, adding the ES7 stuff already. Um, I mean, Axel Rauschmeyer is kind of a genius, in my opinion, uh, do it for doing this, so it, I'd, I'd be lost without him. So now that we have this back, we have class decorators, we have mix-ins back, yay. Okay, so let's talk about uh, where we kind of get with ES7. So before, uh, this was the ES6 version. Uh, so we had uh, the constructor method, passing in props, calling super there. Uh, but then we bound uh, this to tick there. We set the state. Uh, we had our lifecycle methods in the middle and the default props uh, declared down at the bottom. Now, it cleans it up a bit. Um, I really like the fact that we're going to end up with like default props as static, uh, you know, and just being able to declare those right up front. Um, I think it makes more sense to me logically just to see it at top, uh, and you know what's already going to be there, and you don't have to go hunting for it. Uh, kind of right at the beginning of the class, you'll see it, um, and then. Uh, being able to also have state there, I think that's going to make things a lot easier. Um, and you don't have to do the, the constructor declaration. It's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of weird to me, uh, but it's just how it has to work today. Um, and the fat arrows, as long as, I mean, if, if they can get that to, if that is working in ES6 now, that's great. Um, it, like the last tag that was on it was five months ago and it said revisit, so I'm not sure if they actually got back to it. Um, but it looked like there's a pull request, so I don't know if that's been... Anyway, so I don't think it's quite done yet. Um, but I don't think it's an... It's not an ES6 issue necessarily, it's it's the React and how it's calling that and using that um, in, the, in the class, in the component class, so... Okay, so that... Uh, with that, we... Okay, so we talked about the fat arrow binding, uh, which was pretty neat. Uh, being able to define the props and state, uh, default props and state, they kind of get a level up there, which I, I think is great. Uh, Mix-ins, go back to the smiley face, uh, because now we get to actually use them uh, in the 7 so that'll be fun. Uh, so that's uh, basically just to kind of recap everything. We went through a workflow on how to actually build out everything. Um, how to get started, what kind of dependencies you definitely have to have, uh, some NPM scripts to walk through. Uh, it's all in the repo. I can give that out again uh, in case you didn't get it written down. Um, went through some ES6 syntax, changed some things over uh, just to show the difference between S5 and ES6. And then we looked a little bit at the future of ES7 and uh, some of the awesomeness there and how you can start using that today. So uh, with that, that's pretty much the end but open for questions now, if anybody has any, which maybe you will, maybe not. Who's all actually, I mean, who's all using Re React and ES6 today? Okay, so this is all kind of review. Um, sorry for the review, but it, it, um, I mean, it's really once, my, my initial hurdle was just getting to this. You know, and once you get to this, uh, it becomes a lot easier. I think there's a lot more, um, lot more you end up being able to do with it. I don't think there's like uh, anything magical about it. It's just, just some simple syntax stuff uh, that helps you uh, sort of, once you get past those problems, everything becomes a lot easier. So um, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, uh, 
decorator pattern. Mm-hmm. Does that ever, uh, does that ever, does the trapping in another corner of the street ever, uh, have something to do with it? It probably will. I haven't done a extensive testing, um, mostly because I mean, so the US seven is still it's still really new stuff, right? So it's a the the issue on GitHub is just like a mile long of oh we should do it this way we should do it this way we should try this we should try this so I'm not sure where this is going to end up, um, and I think a lot of it's going to come down to like does that cause problems? This seems to be the best solution people have found. Um, so in some of the research I was doing, I didn't see anybody say, like, here's a red flag and you shouldn't do this. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's adding, <clears throat> it's adding life cycle methods to the other component and then just rendering the component out. So, I mean, it seems like it's pretty simple, so I don't know if there's going to be any headaches, really. There's some... If you want to use mixins with without using the class decorators, there are some libraries that will kind of do this thing for you. I haven't thoroughly tested those very much. Um, I don't always advocate for like using a library to do something that isn't really built in yet because it tends to add more complexity, and then you end up with problems with that library and incompatibilities, and uh, it's kind of a pain. So. Um, the, 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 main, the main workaround, to be honest with you, if you want to use Mixin still and not, not do the ES7, because obviously it's, I would not recommend, just to make sure everybody knows that, don't use ES7 straw man in any like real project, right? That's not a plan. Don't do that. Uh, this was more for fun and just to show you kind of where things are headed. You just basically, instead, you, instead of doing, um, you know, class app extends react.component, var app equals react dot create class. Everything else is ES6, and it'll take care of it, and you can add mixins. Um, I kept this pure ES6 to show that mixins don't work quite right. Uh, so, it like no, it nothing works. Like there, I've uh, nothing I've come across has said this is doable. Um, every time I try it, I've had one work with React Router, but I think it's the way they wrote it. It was, it was doable, but there, it's not a simple fix um, with ES6. The, the simplest fix is literally just using the create class method to create your component, and then um, everything else can just be normal ES6, and you can tie in mixins that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, if you can find a way. Uh, awesome. I, I, I nothing. None of my research and none of my trials have actually said that any, that any of this is possible yet. <clears throat> so it sucks because uh, there's a lot of mixins out there, and a lot of them are really freaking useful, you know. So it's, it's it's frustrating to know that that's a limitation. But just use create create class method uh, as you normally would in S5, and everything else can be a six. And then when they have the right support, you can just strip that out easier. Um, so you don't have to stay all ES5, basically. All right. Anything else? No? Well, thanks for your attention. And uh, I'll be out in the hall. Come say hi. Tell me it sucked. Tell me it was great. Whatever. I don't care. Uh, just come say hi. All right. Thanks, guys.